Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast. We are on episode number 59. My name is Dominic. I am one of the co-hosts. The other co-host is Janus, who will appear shortly. In today's episode, we speak to Paulina Gruffman, who is a PhD student in the history of religions at Lund University. She specializes broadly in European occultism from the 1800s until roughly the 1930s, Western esotericism, ancient and modern, as well as the intersection between early psychoanalysis, the occult milieu, and modernism. Her doctoral project concerns the reception of ancient Egyptian religiosity in the works of British occultist and Cambridge scholar G.R.S. Mead and his impact on a range of important personalities in the early to mid-1900s, such as psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Paulina also has a master's in the history of religions from Stockholm University. You can find some of her work on academia.edu. You can also follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Paulina Gruffman, P-A-U-L-I-N-A-G-R-U-F-F-M-A-N. And so today's topic is the same topic as her doctoral project. Um, We are going to be looking at G.R.S. Mead, who was born in 1863. He was an English historian, writer, editor, translator, esotericist, and influential member of the Theosophical Society, as well as the founder of the Quest Society. Uh, Mead's work encompasses all sorts of things, early Christianity, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, Mithraism, ancient Egyptian religiosity, and alchemy, among other things. So if you're into any of that, you might be interested in G.R.S. Mead. His work is readily available and can be found quite easily, so I would definitely check it out if any of those topics interest you, which, if you're listening to our show, I'm sure they do. Before we get started, I definitely want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters. We appreciate you. Thank you for helping us keep the lights on here and help keep the show rolling. If you are interested in helping us out and supporting the show, becoming a partner with us in this work, please feel free. Head over to Patreon and sign up. We dedicate this work to Hermes and Asclepius, and may any merits that we accumulate be distributed to all sentient beings so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening. Okay, we are extremely excited and pleased um, that Paulina Gruffman has come on the show and agreed to talk with us about her research 
surrounding uh, GRS Mead, who is uh, a favorite of ours. Um, welcome to the show, Paulina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, welcome. We're we're excited to have you here too. This is going to be a very interesting conversation. Yeah, as we were talking about a minute ago, um, before we started record, recording, um, Mead has been like highly influential in both of our personal studies. Um, he was one of the scholars and authors I found early on in my my studies into esotericism, and he really um, resonated with me. Just his style and the focus of of his research. Like I really connect with um, his 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 stuff on John the Baptist, Simon Magus. Um, he was doing the Pista Sophia before anyone else. And well, we'll get into all this, but yeah, so this is super exciting. Would you mind maybe starting off with a little bit about yourself and how you got into this particular subject matter and how you got interested in Mead? Yes, sure. So I'm currently a PhD student in the history of religions at Lund University in Sweden. And the focus of my, um, yeah, my PhD project is Mead, uh, along with some other things that I will uh, maybe get back into um, uh, later on here in the show. And I got my master's degree also in the history of religions at Stockholm University uh, with uh, Egil Asprem as my, my supervisor for those of you that might know him from his publications in esotericism. And I'm fortunate to have great supervisors for my PhD project as well. Uh, so one is the Swedish scholar Kristina Müllervold, who works something different for me, but we do have a very similar approach to archival studies. Uh, and also Sonu Shamdasani, who is a expert on uh, C.G. Jung, uh, the psychoanalyst. Wow, the great Shamdasani. That must be amazing. Yes. Um, and he's at uh, University College London. Uh, so we do a lot of sort of meetings over Zoom, which works well, but I'm excited to visit in the fall uh, to actually spend some time uh, in London, since that also happens to be the place where most of the archival um, resource, resources are available that uh, have to do with need in some way. And uh, how I got into this, I when I started uh, sort of scouring and looking for um, a topic for my master's thesis, I was interested in the notion of uh, gnosis or gnosis and uh, had not heard of Mead actually, but I I uh, quickly found found Mead through just some simple sort of, you know, go, go, Googling and looking around uh, since he was a huge, um, had a huge influence on the development of that practice or uh, sort of theory or method or whatever you want to call it, depending on your uh, particular uh, sort of uh, way of approaching uh, it. And um, yeah, and I got really fascinated with just uh, how much he wrote, like the, the the sort of width of his scholarship and also the fact that he there was so little published on him. And so my master's thesis turned into a study of his understanding of theosophy, uh, since he was a member of the Theosophical Society, uh, an esoteric organization that formed in 1875, uh, where he was the, both the private secretary to uh, Helena Blavatsky, the, one of the founders of the movement, and he was also largely understood as the sort of scholar of the Theosophical Society, publishing a lot of books on ancient mystery religions, um, such as Gnosticism and Hermetism or Hermeticism, along with, uh, as, as well as Neoplatonism and, yeah, a, a lot of different things. And, um, yeah, so I just sort of stuck with need uh, for that reason. I hope that 
Yeah, no, that's that's Answer great. The question. <laughs> so yes. let me let me before we jump right into me, let me ask you. So you said you were interested in gnosis. What, according to your understanding, does that term mean? It's funny. I was just contemplating this before we began this interview. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great question. <laughs> I wish I had a great answer to it as well. Um, it's a it's a very it's a really difficult thing to sort of establish an an understanding uh, in regards to uh, within my field of uh, esotericism or Western esotericism. There are so many different ways of understanding gnosis. Um, there are some scholars that argue that it's more like a theoretical sort of tool to understand historical practices um, that corresponds to, or that means something akin to uh, transformational or higher knowledge. Uh, but it, it was also it's also a term that was used in some ancient writing um, with un- meanings that are a little bit difficult for us to uh, grasp and un- establish today. Um, and then there's, of course, gnosis in so many more contemporary and um, pra- uh, like practices today, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of different in a lot of different esoteric traditions. There's different understandings of gnosis. Uh, so <laughs> it's hard to to answer it, but I I found in my MA that for for Mead, gnosis meant the same thing that the Osophim meant, actually. Uh, he just sort of changed terms in my understanding. Um, and that's divine wisdom, simply. Uh, or not simply, It's a, you could also you spend a lot of time uh, unpacking that. But uh, it's, it's, it's a type of knowledge that's really sort of, it changes you at the core. Uh, according to Mead, and also to a lot, of, of course, other um, practitioners and individuals as well. But I would, I would sort of stick to Mead's understanding of of gnosis, which of course also changed a little bit over time. Even though I would re- still say that it's remains largely intact from his time in the Theosophical Society until the time of his death. So, yeah. Uh, I again <laughs> I hope that sort of answers the question. Totally. I, totally. Maybe, yeah. It answers Sorry, it so. well. Um and I was gonna say it also seems like Mead understood Gnosis as um as it was articulated by the Christian Gnostics, especially well in terms of it being a um a form of a salvific experiential spiritual knowledge, but at the same time also a sort of like you said, a divine wisdom almost akin to the Sanskrit yana. Yes. Uh, yes, I left out the salvific part, definitely, and it's uh, crucial to his understanding of it. And it's also crucial to his, uh, or another crucial aspect is his understanding of Gnosis as something that was very t- tightly sort of connected to the Gnostics. But I w- would also add, that actually, that he... Also, at uh, in like the mid 1910s, he he thought of gnosis or expressed so in writing that he thought of gnosis as a general thing that actually existed in many different uh, religious traditions. Uh, I can't recall at the moment any specific mention of sort of Indian religions and and uh, the don't know how to pronounce it, but Jnana uh, concepts, which I've also sort of pondered in the past as well, because th- they seem very similar. But I, I can't remember if Mead actually wrote anything specific on that, but he certainly uh, thought of Gnosis as something you could find in many re- religions, as well as um, likely in other types of like philosophical traditions in scientific traditions, if only they were applied in the correct way. Interesting, interesting. So let's jump into 
a big question. Who was GRS Mead? Because I think that some of our audience is going to be familiar with him, perhaps just in a passing way. We're going to have a lot of people listening who, who may, who may not be familiar with him. And I, personally, I think that's a shame. So let's let's what, historically, who was this man? Yes, um, Mead. So he was. I can begin with just stating the sort of time period that we're in. And Mead was born in 1863, uh, lived until 1933. So he lived during a very, 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 very interesting uh, time period where, where a lot of things sort of occurred in various uh, different uh, parts of uh, like culture. And in just the, this historical period is very, uh, produced a lot of different things. Um, and he was born in uh in a small city that's outside of uh Warwickshire in in the United Kingdom or in England and quickly sort of moved away from there and attended a school uh that I forget exactly where it was current but it's a different part of England uh also not a very like large city but it's a his parents were definitely upper middle class because it was a private school that had a quite a you needed to pay a lot of money to get in there basically um but something more general about me is that uh before sort of uh, adding more biographical information is that he uh he was both a scholar educated at this private school and then later at Cambridge um in classics uh, he also, uh, again, he published a lot of books um, on various, mostly Hellenistic religions, like mystery religions. And uh, he, in addition to that, he was also an occultist. Um, he was a member of the Theosophical Society, more of a leader, I would say, than a member. Um, he was part of Helena Blavatsky's esoteric section of the Theosophical Society, uh, which was a smaller subset organization, not officially connected to, to the Theosophical Society, but I think most, if not all, um, members were also members of the Theosophical Society. Uh, and he was also part of the inner group of that esoteric section, which was a very sort of small group of 12 individuals that were handpicked uh, for occult study. Me took a lot of interest in various different forms of organizations. Um, he was early on became a member of the Royal Asiatic uh, Association of Great Britain, uh, which is, uh, from my understanding, quite difficult to get into and requires that you have a good standing among scholars and especially sort of uh, scholars working on Indian religions and Indian other aspects of Indian society. And he was also a member of, uh, later on in his life, uh, various organizations that had to do with psychical studies. So that was another research interest of, it, of his. Uh, he had an organization called the Quest Society that he formed after leaving the Theosophical Society in 1909. And that was a really fascinating group because they um, they weren't that big. They were, I think they had some 500 members uh, at most. But at the same time, it attracted a lot of interesting individuals, such as William Butler Yeats, um, the poet and author. And also, I'm not going to go on and name drop a bunch of individuals, but Largely, they were uh, artists, authors, art critics, um, individuals interested in various forms of uh, study of religion and uh, specialists sort of in, in their respective fields. So it's a very important society that requires more study. And I haven't gotten gotten really far in, in that yet, but it's definitely going to be part of uh, my PhD studies, um, since I'm only still in my my um, first year at the moment. Cool. Is uh, there is there any? Sorry to interrupt. Is there any remnant of the Quest Society that survives today? 
that you know? Well, we know we know where they met uh, in Kensington Town Hall in London, and I'm still looking, and I'm really hoping to find uh, complete membership lists, uh, as well as any any other documents uh, like minutes from meetings and um, titles of lectures, or even if anyone uh, transcribed uh, lectures. Um, because that's that's what I know uh, at the moment of the Quest Society is they they published um, a magazine called the Quest Quarterly Review, which is in in a lot of respects it's a sort of a continuation of Means um, or not Means Journal, but the Theosophical Journal, uh, the Quest. Or sorry, the Theosophical Review, which Mead edited uh, for some time before he ended up creating the Quest Society and, and leaving Theosophy behind. So I see those as so overlapping in some regards. Um, so we know they, they published articles in this journal that Mead edited, and we know that they met uh, and listened to lectures, but we don't really know exactly what they did. And I think that's really in, uh, like exciting to think about because, uh, I mean, of course that could be it, but it could also be other types of practices and things that they did together during the meetings. It's particularly interesting to me because of a few, few reasons for, first of all, it seems like perhaps, um, you know, the publishing arm of the Theosophical Society is still called, I think, Quest Publishing. And I, it seems like that must be an inheritance of that. And um, also, you know, from what I understand in early theosophy, before things changed, there was a more experimental um, experimental component where they were doing magical magical workings and things like that, theurgic workings. Only later did it shift to more of a focus on mysticism per Blavatsky's direction. And it, it just makes me wonder if Mead himself was engaged in some kind of theurgical practices, especially given um, given the given his proclivities for writing on those spe that specific uh, point? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, or like connection that you do between the quest and the quest publishing and also the practices of the early Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society, if I begin at that end, they had uh, three objectives that sort of shifted over time. And the, the when it, what ended up being the third objective the investigation into the mysteries of nature and the sort of laws that govern the universe and psychical phenomena. Um, that was actually the first uh, objective that was then reformulated uh, several times. But uh, in a way, you could say that was the first objective of the Theosophical Society when they first uh, formed in 1875. And it continued to be so, uh, like you say, with various sort of experiments and uh, theological practices, uh, etc. During the 1880s, and I, well, so it's hard with me. Uh, I don't know what he did, like in his private home, so much, um, and I don't know exactly what uh, he did together with the other members of the inner group and the other members of the esoteric section. Uh, so it's it's hard to speak on private practice, but I know from this, the official things that he, that he has said at various times during his life, that he, he did not really have any respect for, nor did he encourage individuals to, sort of turn to the the wrong ends of magic or the wrong ends of occultism. And he also sort of spoke about the inner group and the esoteric section uh, as a bit of a negative experience for him and something that he he said he would he did not want any uh and this is pretty much uh, an exact quote uh, he said I don't want any occultism or esotericism or anything of the kind in the Quest Society. And I think that was in in a retrospect, uh, like 19, late 1920s. 
but at the same time, he never actually ended up telling anyone, uh, at, at least pu publicly in publishing, the secrets of what sort of occurred uh, in the inner group, in the satiric section, in the Quest Society. <laughs> There's a lot of things that were left silent and secret. And even if, so if you say he wanted to sort of speak negatively about uh, various forms of occult practice, it's it's as though he still wanted it to, to remain secret. And in a way that to me gives um, a suspicion that maybe he ha had more of a sort of affirmative and positive view on matter than he would publicly let out. Um, and which could also be strategic from him. Uh, maybe he didn't want to be associated with magic or occultism, uh, but wanted to be seen more of, uh, as a non-occultist uh, scholar. Are you able to speak on maybe the relationship he had with the Theosophical Society from the beginning and then how that changed towards towards the end? Sure, yeah. Um, Mead, so he entered the Theosophical Society in the 1880s, and that was after he uh, got his bachelor's degree from uh, uh, from Cambridge. And I think that was that was uh, it was during his studies there that he discovered the Theosophical Society. I don't yet know the details of his how he got into contact with Blavatsky and how he so quick sort of rather quickly uh, came to be her private secretary and got to work with her so closely. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he took it very seriously. Uh, he spent so much time um, writing on theosophical matters in the theosophical magazines and in sort of traveling and did a lot of lectures abroad. Um, you know, he, I think he took it very seriously and he really enjoyed um, the, the kinds of theosophy that resonated with him. But I also see a tension that arose quite quickly with, within his sort of relationship with theosophy where he saw many different ways of understanding theosophy sort of emerging uh, in the journals, in meetings, and also in practice. And I think that was a problem for him because he didn't like when people did things that were sort of outside of scope of the three obje objectives. So I've always called him a sort of a conservative uh, theosophist in that regard, because he was—he really did not want you to deviate from the three objectives. Um, and sorry, what was the other part of? I was just of, curious how the relationship changed because it seemed like as the Theosophical Society evolved, that there were a lot of different relationships and. Uh, a lot of politics and not everyone was getting along. And it sounded like towards the end of his um, involvement with them, things were kind of um, uh, tumultuous. Oh yeah. 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 Sure. Um, yeah. So the, the official sort of uh, point of tension or reason why Mead left the Theosophical Society, but also sort of prior to him leaving, why he started to feel frustrated with theosophy. Uh, the, the official reason is that he disagreed with the decision to reinstate uh, Charles Webster Leadbeater um, as a member and also a leading figure uh, mm -hmm. in the Theosophical Society. Uh, Charles Webster Leadbeater, he was a um, partner of Annie Besant, and he was also uh, charged with... Um, sort of sexual misconduct which translates to or is a nicer way of saying uh yeah he he did some pretty uh serious uh things under the name of theosophy towards children um and Mead was active in sort of spreading that information uh, not spreading it just for the sake of letting people know but mostly in order for um, the Theosophical Society to take responsibility and not have Leadbeater be 
uh, in the position that he was in um, as a member. And when the decision was made to um, keep him as a member, he, I think Mead was quite frustrated and ended up sort of together with other people uh, leaving in protest of that. But at the same time, um, I can see a lot of disagreements occurring between Besant and Leadbeater uh, earlier uh, than that, especially after Blavatsky died. Uh, I think that had to do with Mead's understanding of Blavatsky as just one sort of theosophist rather than as the theosophist, the, mm. the most important sort of teacher of theosophy. There's a really interesting article that he wrote uh, on the masters uh, that was quite early uh, in his theosophical career, where he spoke about the masters not being a sort of supernatural uh, or supernatural entities, but rather uh, that co the concept of the masters he uh, thought needed to be understood as more in a sort of mythical way as a as a symbol for self mastery and self wisdom and teaching yourself and i think that was quite controversial uh since for a lot of members the the masters were very much a real thing uh real sort of entities or people that you could have relationships with so um I think that's there were several such points of tension where he had different interpretations that maybe some other theosophists did. Interesting. And yeah, it gives us it gives us insight into just his moral character and kind of what made him who he was, the the fact that he was willing to take a stand and 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 rock the boat in that way, I think is is very interesting. Do we know <clears throat> going to his, back to his personal kind of Gnosis or his personal uh, practices. Do we know what his motivation or inspiration was, uh, which steered him in this direction towards occult and esoteric studies? Oh yeah, that's a great question, and I really wish I could mm. give a great answer <laughs> because I, I that's been something that I've been thinking a lot about, uh, mm. especially concerning why he left. Uh, Theosophy and why he continued to write on certain topics for so long and maybe sort of dabble in some and then give them up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the initial motivation was uh, or the continuing motivation, but I think he was a, he needs to be understood as a person that was very interested in and sort of cared a lot for history. Mm -hmm. So for him, even though he, he writes a lot about Gnosis as this, sort of practice um that you can you can partially uh get closer to through study mm -hmm. uh and through historical uh, yeah through studying history i think a large component of that was also ethics um he or sorry a large component of like what motivated him was ethics because he was also very interested in doing doing the right thing for yourself and for others and the right thing a lot of time had to do with the be, being open and being able to transform and i think that, that that's one of the things that made him stick to certain kinds of writings because uh or certain kinds of historical currents mm -hmm. and the ones that had the promise of becoming different and one, and this is really just, uh, I, I can't fully establish this as a fact, but uh, one thing that I that I think might have contributed to this is the fact that his, his father um, was in the military and his, his uh, wife, Laura, who is also a theosophist, Laura uh, Cooper was her maiden name. She also had a fa father who was in the military and who was pretty high up there, uh, Fre Frederick Cooper. Um, he participated in the Indian Revolution or the Indian Mutiny um, mm. and uh, wrote a, a book on it that was quite explicit in his role and sort of 
um, murdering people. And I think for both me as well as, as for Laura, with with their sort of colonial past and their their parents being uh, so engaged in the military, and I assume that both Mead and Laura, or yeah, inherited money from their parents uh, since they were quite well off. I think maybe they felt it was important to sort of give back in some way and transform in the sense of of becoming a better person, a person that did not have this sort of um, baggage and that uh, helped helped out rather than took, if that makes sense. I find it interesting, too, given Theosophy's positive role in uh, India's struggle for uh, independence as well. There's a sort of, from an Indian point of view, one would almost say a shared karma there. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really intriguing that you brought that point up because he was so deeply involved with the Theosophical Society. Who, I mean, they were they they were you know they were celebrated by India as playing a major role in that. Exactly, and he was he was also um, part uh, like later in his life he was um, took part in an organization that that sought to help out like poor Indian children uh and students but that was less outside of the scope of of the theosophical society because they did similar things and i think yeah he had a he was i think he was probably quite like uh empathetic empathetic and like cared for other people and that's also how he's been described in the few uh like por- per- portraits of his uh, personal character that I've come across so far. That's really beautiful because we see a person who had this deep, profound mind and scholarly acumen who seemed to always be searching for the truth. And then at the same time in his practical life and his active life, there is this personal expression of compassion that just makes him an even more beautiful human being for that reason, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think the I think those are quite nice motivations to have if th- those were indeed his motivations, uh, and the fact that he was so ca- like cared so much for sort of change for many individuals rather than just for himself. So, so let me ask you this: Do you can do you have you looked at? the relationship between Mead and Blavatsky? Because wasn't he very closely associated with her for qu- quite some time? Um, do, you, do you have any knowledge of what their personal relationship, what, what the character of that was like? Were they close? Was it purely formal? Yeah, I think they were very close at a time. And I think a lot of that um, could be the reason why they did have some personal conflicts. Uh, from which is at least what I've sort of found from um, mostly later uh, quotes that that Mead uh, has expressed. But I think a lot of the things that Mead had to say about Blavatsky later on in his life, that she was difficult to work with, she was not that great of a scholar, uh, she was crazy or, you know, had remarkable ideas. I think a lot of those things that he had to say, they were probably based in the fact that he was so close to her that he was able to also criticize her in the manner that he did. And I think he remained quite loyal to her even after he left uh, the Theosophical Society. Also, uh, since he maybe not explicitly expressed it, but he it seems implicit that he didn't like the the, the turn that Theosophy had taken after that, after she passed. And um, so I would say that they definitely did have a relationship that was both positive and and, and negative, but it was uh, definitely close uh, during the time that they worked together. Yeah, me, it definitely seems like um, the earlier breed of theosophists who were not on board with the whole Krishnamurti controversy and really the the whole direction that Bailey and Leadbeater tried to take the society later on. Yeah, certainly. 
Because there was also that splinter, the couple splinter groups from the Theosophical Society um, that just refused and broke off. I, I was always surprised that he hadn't become part of those. Another thing I wonder about was the fact that if you look at Isis Unveiled, probably due to her connections to the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor um, and things like that, there's a favorable attitude towards Gnosticism, Hermetism, Neoplatonism, the Egyptian mysteries. But of course, her her next chapter of work takes a very, very Eastern course. Yet Mead, through the trajectory of his work, stayed firmly focused on the on that sort of, we could say, Alexandrian matrix of, you know, no, Gnosticism, both Christian and non-Christian, Hermetism, Neoplatonism. I mean, and it, it's interesting to me, but I wonder if this there was tension between them because of this and how he reconciled that, because it seems as though in his private work, he was continuing that focus, whereas I, I haven't seen much Ever, I haven't seen much written by Mead on esoteric Buddhism or anything like that, you know? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I am currently working on an extended sort of bibliography of uh, all of Mead's published works. And one of the books that I found recently that has, that has not been covered in previous um, bibliographies, or there's one previous uh, by... Nicholas Sinclair, Goodrich Clark. Um, one of the books that I found was actually uh, a book about it's a it's co-written with a with an Indian author, and it's on the practice of breathing, like esoteric hmm. breathing practices. So I would actually say uh, just just a minor sort of thing here in the beginning is that he did write on Indian religions. Um, perhaps more so in the beginning of his uh, theosophical career, but also like throughout, like even as a, in, during the time in, in the quest, he wrote on Indian religions. And yeah, I, but it's at the same time, he definitely, like you say, he, he focused on uh, more sort of uh, Western, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, religious currents and traditions and I think maybe, and now I'm just guessing, but I think maybe he wanted it to do do so because he thought that it was that it that what was needed for theosophy or later for, I guess, uh, the comparable study of religion uh, was a more balanced understanding of the different traditions of the world, uh, where we didn't just focus on Eastern thought, but we focus on and examine and scrutinize, you know, the the traditions that have existed throughout man's time on earth and throughout the, the world. Uh, so that would be one guess. The other thing I have to th sort of say about this is that I think he wanted the change to occur within the, theos the Theosophical Society where there was an emphasis on... Uh, the more Western sort of uh, practices because there were so many people leaving theosophy to form these organizations focused on a very similar pursuit, but that had to do with Western rather than Eastern uh, religious traditions. So maybe he wanted to sort of balance it out just so that theosophy would continue to be the core uh practice and it wouldn't be so divided amongst various um esotericists during the time you know the thing the thing that really gets me is when i read me there's this incredible depth of understanding of as you said there's there's this historical scholarship this this just amazing ability to excavate minutia of of um religious movements and also infer and intuit the connections between things um, in such a way that just brings out the greater picture. For instance, and m maybe my favorite work by him, Fragments of a Faith Forgotten, which I think if you study Gnosticism, there's no way you shouldn't be looking at that book very closely. 
Um, I, I feel that all of his work stands up to the test of time, but that book in particular. But he gets into the conflict, for instance, between the sect, uh, sects of the Ebionites and the Elkasites in there, and how that relates to uh, the descriptions in the book of Acts about the dispute between Simon of Samaria and Paul, and how that story was transferred um, from the conflict between those two sects who identified with Petrine and Pauline Christianity to Simon Magus after there was a reconciliation. Now, that's an incredible feat of just of just scholarship on its own. And you find that throughout his writings, this, this depth and this incisive, uh, perceptive acumen. Yet, it seems like he's been marginalized by scholarship on one hand and by esotericism on the other. And I'm hoping that's changing. Are you seeing a shift? Um, is it your hope to sort of produce some of that shift? Yes, I I would agree with you definitely that um, his his works are incredibly rich um, in sort of making connections between things and very uh, interesting readings of uh, the various uh, historical movements that he has studied. One one thing that I can see coming back, and that one thing that sort of definitely really really stands the, the test of time is his emphasis on ancient Egypt as a sort of, in many cases, the cradle uh, for uh, later traditions and later um, impulses, and I, and we can see this with the the studies in Hermeticism that are taking place today, uh, whereas Mead was overlooked during most of the, the 20th century, I would say, there's been a, a small uh, but maybe growing impulse to return to Mead and to really consider whether or not, for instance, the Corpus Hermeticum could have been perhaps not written down uh, in Egypt, but at least like existed as a practice or an oral tradition uh, that Egyptian priests sort of carried out. Uh, And that's something that their contemporary uh, scholarship working on sort of reconsidering those findings that Mead uh, had like 130 years ago. And uh, also I would say, Yes, I definitely. Um, I'm. I want to. <laughs> I want more people to read me than to to think about what he said. Um, but especially in regards to the general study of religions and comparative religious religious studies, I I think he had a he played a really important role there, and I think that has been. People are quick to think that oh well he was you know his worldview was colored by theosophy so there's no point in and now I'm thinking of um academic scholars who working throughout the 20th century a lot of them appear to have thought of me as being colored by his theosophical worldview um but I'm finding more and more that when he was active his contemporaries even within the academe uh actually did think of him as a solid scholar not everyone of course but there there's definitely a a growing number of reviews that i'm uh, that i've found that that give positive reviews of Mead's books and also a growing interest among scholars today as well so do you feel like Mead is still relevant for today uh in both an academic sense and in um in in a esoteric sense Yes, I think there's a lot to be learned from studying Mead, uh, reg- regardless of like the, the purpose or the way you're doing it or what you want to <laughs> sort of get from it. I think he's relevant for uh, for a lot of people. Let's say that, yeah. Yeah, I th- I, I really appreciate another thing I want to mention about Mead me that I really appreciate is he could put together a voluminous tome um, you know, several hundreds of pages exacting and specific focusing on every detail. 
at the same time, he was also capable of writing in a succinct, concise way to deliver a message that packed a punch and focused on the main points, like his series Echoes from the Gnosis. Those are short writings. Those are short books, but you can learn so much on hermetism, neoplatonic theurgy, uh, Christian Gnosticism. And then you have things like his translation of the Pistis Sophia, which is obviously a labor of love. That's incredible to me. He had this breadth of, of, of vision and ability where he was able to, to go in multiple different directions with things and, and tailor his message to the audience that was listening. And I, I really appreciate that about him. Yeah, I think you summarize him and his work really well. He definitely had a great talent at both cap- capturing the complexity uh, of the phenomenon in question, and as well as writing in a way that was accessible for people. And I'm quite sure that was one of the reasons he wrote in the way that he did, Uh because he wanted, he geared uh, his writings towards not just members of the Theosophical Society and not just, you know, people affiliated with academic institutions, but he wanted his message uh, to really reach as many as possible. And I think that's commendable and something that a lot of academic scholars today should aim for. Uh, so it's that's another reason to sort of actually l- look at his writing style and consider what he gets said in, in in what way and how much he says. And so, in, in for instance, with the example you gave of the Echoes from the Gnosis series, in, in like short, um, short volumes, he gets a lot said. So, yeah, I agree. So, Paulina, what's on the horizon for you? So, of course, the main, the main thing for me now is the three years left, roughly, uh, I have of my PhD. Uh, I might get it extended as I will also teach during this time uh, courses in occultism and in uh, large, uh, like more broad courses in the history of religions. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm currently applying for funding uh, for my travels to, to England, to London, um i'm mapping out archives and archival sources i'm also yeah i'm, I'm working on that bibliography that i mentioned pr- before so I'm, I'm really trying to write a comprehensive bibliography of of uh, as many of meat's works that i can find i've under- i realize it's not possible probably to write a like one that covers everything since he wrote so much and a a lot of it has gotten lost very unfortunately due to the sort of material uh degradation of the 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 paper that he had his writing published on um so those are uh the things that i'm doing now uh also looking more into the early fields of the academic study of religion during the 19th century to in order to get a better grasp of what the sort of milieu that he was writing in and the people he had around him and yeah so that's really exciting well i can't thank you enough uh this was such an interesting discussion and um on one of my favorite favorite all-time authors on mysticism esotericism um you know uh, and I, I think it's so great that somebody is focusing on mead and not just mead as a, you know, as a secondary or tertiary subject, but as a primary subject. I think that time has come. And um, I hope that your work uh, gets a lot of exposure and that you're provided with all the resources and opportunities you need to to track down every little detail you can. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I hope so as well. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Paulina. Thank you so, so much for having me. I had a lot of fun discussing this with you. Absolutely. It's, it, Same. We're, we're passionate about GRS Mead. We love him. So when I saw that you were doing this work, we were both, I was like, Don, we got to have her on the show. And he was like, oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, keep us posted on what you're doing so we can promote anything you do. 
because we like to promote our guests and help them, you know, try and help them be as successful as possible. So if there's anything you want us to tell people about and put the signal out about, we would be delighted to do that. Okay, that was Paulina Gruffman on GRS Mead, the legend. It's a shame, really, that GRS Mead isn't as well known, but thanks to Ms. Gruffman's ministrations, hopefully his name will become more widespread. I can't emphasize enough how much of an impact GRS Mead's work had on me. I mean, his books are just incredible. My favorite is probably Fragments of a Faith Forgotten. It's it's the definitive compendium of Gnostic scriptures outside of the Nag Hammadi library. I mean, he, and he translated these things himself. So, I mean, he was translating from the church fathers, from fragments, excerpts, and also offering interpretations, which are wonderful too, because he really was a deep esotericist. So you're getting a scholarly element with him, and then you're getting this experiential understanding of a lot of these things with his writings. His books on the Hermetic Mysteries um, are great. Thrice Greatest Hermes, Echoes from the Gnosis. He even writes, I think, on the myth, on the Mithraic Mysteries. He writes on Apollonius of Tiana. I mean, Mead was prolific, and he put out so many books. And they, I, everything I've ever read by him was excellent. I'm sure you could agree, Tom. Yeah, he's always been a favorite of mine, as as I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, even given the time period that he was writing and studying in, his works have continued to to be relevant. Um, and a, a lot of times you get these scholars from the 1800s, and it's like, well, you know, so much new information has come out since then, they're not as relevant. But um even given the fact that he didn't have access to like the Nag Hammadi library that was discovered much, you know, later after, after he died, not too much later after he died, but he didn't have access to it. Even given that fact, he was um, one of the earlier uh, scholars looking at Gnosticism seriously with what, you know, scholarship they had available, what material they had available and what he did have and what he was able to, to the conclusions he was able to come to were were very well informed. Um, he was very good at, as as we mentioned at making connections between things and seeing the deeper levels that beneath the surface. I mean, you mentioned some of his work; those are all excellent. I mean, he wrote the definitive book on Simon Magus as well. Nothing better has been written since then um, that I've ever come across, and I've definitely looked. So. Uh, it would definitely be worth anyone's time to to look into his writings and his his work. And we didn't even touch on the fact that uh, he had a significant influence on Carl Jung. Obviously, Jung is is very well known and very influential. And for me to have had an influence on him, I think speaks volumes. Absolutely. And the Pista Sophia is another one he translated. Now, that's a pretty voluminous work. I mean, that had, it just so much of this was a labor of love for him. And as I said in the episode, even more so, I think, because if you look at what was being examined by theosophical writers, especially Blavatsky, but also Leadbeater and Besson, they were all so focused on other things. He's the one... Um, perhaps with the exception of Anna Kingsford, who also focused on uh, the Hermetic and Gnostic ideas of Alexandria, uh, who was also someone worth examining as well. Um, I think Mead's writings accompany Kingsford's very well. Um, but, you know, he he was a labor of love, and he was acting kind of against the grain, against the current of what the entire group of people he was associated with were doing. And then just to hear... Paulina described his character, that he was an upstanding, honorable man who went out of his way to act charitably and help others. It's just really just adds this another layer to it. Not only was he a a respect a respectable scholar doing groundbreaking work uh and in offering valuable interpret interpretive component to that work, but he was also genuinely trying to benefit others in real life. I mean, just such a cool person. And to me, this is somebody who's walking the walk and not just 
putting information out there and talking the talk. Okay, nicely said. What uh, what do you got for us this week as far as the book segment? I want to mention one more thing. So if you're interested in GRS Mead, I am just mentioned Anna Kingsford. You'd probably like her books. The Perfect Way is one of the greats by her. Uh, I believe she also, with Edward Maitland, did a translation of the hermetic book, The Virgin of the World, or the Kori Kosmu, um, which accompanies Mead's work nicely. Another... Another wonderful writer from that era and a little bit just a touch later that Dom and I both loved uh, at the same time we were encountering Mead stuff, I think, for the first time is Alvin Boyd Kuhn, another sort of yeah. unknown writer who fell by the wayside, who's just incredible, who was amazing. Uh, and I just wanted to mention him as well, because there was just this, there were these writers in that era who really were doing it out of a love for it and weren't seeking a fame or a name or renown. And I think you can find some really valuable stuff in what they contributed. So the book I have for this week is by a man named Gregory Peters. It is called Yogini Magic. It's intriguing. Uh, Gregory is a devotee of the goddess Kali, a tantric initiate, and also initiated into Zogchen and some Western occult traditions. This book has um, really impressed me. It is scholarly without being dry, but also very practical. And it discusses the yoginis, who are these powerful feminine uh, beings, these... You know, I guess you could call them witch goddesses or or um, uh, tantric goddesses or, you know, spiritual potencies. But they, they represent these very powerful, um, very, very powerful influences. And you find them in um, Hindu Tantra, but you also find them in Buddhist Tantra. And I believe in, in Buddhist Tantra, they're called Zakinis, but we're essentially dealing with the same entities, for instance, the the Mahavidya uh, Chinamasta in in Shaktism in India is known as Vajrayogini in Tantric Buddhism, and so this book provides you with a, a, a comprehensive evaluation of the Yogini, as well as uh, practical ways to engage with them and invoke them and approach them and develop relationships with them. I'm really impressed with it. It's, it's, it's a, it has a very pretty art on the cover. Uh, It doesn't look kind of chintzy and cheesy. Like a lot of occult books these days are looking Uh, It's very pretty art. It's very well written. Uh, It has many references to traditional, um, traditional tantric scriptures. It has some great, it has a great glossary at the end to help you with any terminology you may be unfamiliar with. And it does a great job contextualizing the yogini, the dakini, within their traditional worship. Well, at the same time, this book is written for a Western audience. So it's nice because it makes it something that might seem too alien or exotic, more accessible for people from a more Western background. And again, this is written by Gregory Peters. Uh, It's published by original Falcon Press, Yogini Magic. Sounds awesome. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, for listening. As always, we appreciate your support. We appreciate your listenership. Um, So we also want to, like we like to do occasionally, uh, we are not being paid for this, but I want to plug a business, small business that we appreciate. Uh, It's called Hermes of Vallis. This is a woman in, I believe in Oregon. She makes ritual candles, baths, bath bombs, bath salts, bath teas. Uh, And all of the, all all of her offerings are astrologically elected. So for instance, um, you know, there's travel tins, votives, tea lights. So for the votives, they're made during significant astrological transits. Right now there's a Saturn and Aquarius votive, Mars and Capricorn. There's one for the Hierophant tarot card, 
as well as some of the other tarot cards. There's also Venus and Libra. So these are useful because they're they're made, these candles are poured during traditional astrological elections. So it's a very useful resource for you if you're doing specific work that's focused along one of the astral rays. And um, then the baths are cool too, because you can take a bath and the appropriate herbs to attune yourself to the vibrations of the of the astrological election and then you have a candle that you can use then to petition the spirits of of that election so it's impressive it's also i believe a um you know independently owned small business it appears that she does everything on her own i appreciate this it looks like she also offers tarot readings and maybe astrological readings we like to promote people occasionally as we've done in the past, uh, that are doing things that we appreciate. And so check her out. It's uh, www.hermesofvalis.com. Nice. Okay. I think that's it for this episode. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for your support. You can find us on YouTube, uh, Spotify, iTunes, all the normal spots that you find podcasts. That's about it. So until next time, Thank you.